feel like I'm leaning this way because people, this, this side is, is, is heavy with people and this side has a few and so. Well, Y'all can talk to David after the service. <laughs> Today, um, fourth Sunday of Advent, as I mentioned, uh, tonight we'll have our Christmas uh, Eve service at 5 o'clock. There will be child care, and I hope you maybe have uh, invited friends or family to come with you. Uh, that normally don't uh, attend maybe worship or don't have a church to attend on Christmas Eve. So uh, 5 o'clock this afternoon. But today, uh, even though it is Christmas Eve, it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we have gone through uh, now these four words, today being the fourth. The first one was hope, and Jesus is our hope. The second one was peace, that in Him we find peace. Last week was joy. I made the... Uh, statement last week that abiding abiding love <coughs> leads to abounding joy. Abiding love leads to abounding joy. That in Him our joy may be complete. We looked at that prescription of abiding in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, here's the prescription for joy. If you will abide in my word, <coughs> If you will abide in my love, if you will abide in my commandments, then he says, your joy, my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. So today we look at this word love. And my hope is, is that in a few minutes we will have been able to grasp the vastness of God's love for us, to grasp that vastness. Preaching on love, God's love, is very difficult. You say, why? It's because it's so vast. How could I preach on God's love and give you uh, uh, the full extent that it deserves in 25 or 30 minutes? How could I do that? Um, it would be kind of like if y'all had never seen the ocean. And uh, I was to tell you that this is ocean water. Would that give you any understanding of really what the ocean was if I told you this was ocean water? Um, how about if I pour this water over Rich's head, <laughs> it is, Rich, is, is Rich going to get the full experience of knowing what the ocean is like? I'm not sure that I'm going to get some experience if I do that. But, um, <laughs> He's not going to understand, even if I claim that this is ocean water, to know that, um, that experience of, of knowing what it's like. So, I'm going to load all of you up this morning in a bus. It's out in the parking lot. I'm going to take you down to Atlantic Beach and get you to walk out into the water. Would you get the full extent of what the vastness of oceans are? I would say no. The other night, I heard this young lady and uh, Ted Lithgow's uh, wife, Karen, talking about beaches. And they were talking about the vast differences in the beaches just along the East Coast, much less the West Coast, much less anywhere else in the world. Beaches are different. And so just to go to Atlantic Beach, you're not going to experience the vastness of an ocean. My point is this, God's love is so vast, and I probably won't do it justice, but this morning I want us to just get a glimpse of this amazing love, this all-encompassing love, this powerful love that God has for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I hope we get a glimpse this morning. So if you have your scriptures, you want to follow along this morning, there's three passages we have been doing in Isaiah text over this Advent season, and this will be the fourth one, and this comes from Isaiah, the seventh chapter, and it's the fourteenth verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with a child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel passage that I shared last week with you from 
the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, I want to share again with you these three verses because it speaks of the love of God and the love of Christ. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that, remember, so that, some important things follow, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And then the final verse. If you were in Sunday school last week, I told you that I was going to have this verse in the sermon this morning. And it's the familiar one. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that's the King James Version, but that's how I memorized it. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So where do you start with trying to get us to get a glimpse of the love of God? I don't know um, any other place to start than at the beginning. And at the beginning is in creation. You see... The first chapter of Genesis tells us that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is present. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters of the earth, and He creates. And in six days, He creates all that we know, including mankind. He creates man and woman to be in relationship with Him. That is why we were created. We were created to be in relationship with God the Creator. And God came, walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. God loved. He's love. But then the fall of man happened. Man's disobedience towards God. Sin entered the world. And for us to be completely reconciled back into that relationship with God, the way God intended for it to be, there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice. The perfect, sinless one. God's plan of redemption began to take place when you look at the third chapter of Genesis and we see that the seed of woman will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent being sin and Satan. And so God's love for the world, He provided, even in the beginning, He provided a way for redemption. He loves us so much. You fast forward a few years and you have Abraham and Isaac and you look at Genesis 22 and in that second verse God tells Abraham Abraham take your son. It's interesting the next phrase. Your only son. And go to the place where I will show you and sacrifice him. You go to verse 8. And Abraham and Isaac are walking along. And Isaac turns to his dad. And he says, Hey dad, I see the wood. I got it on my back. I, I see we, we, we can ignite this wood, but I don't see the lamb for sacrifice. And Abraham looks at Isaac and says, the Lord God will provide the lamb for sacrifice. Come, my son. This is a wonderful picture of how much God loves us. He provided His Son, only Son, for sacrifice. We go to this text in the prophet Isaiah and the Jews are in captivity. They are facing uh, their disobedience to God. And Isaiah is telling them, look, there's hope. There's, there's, there's a coming Messiah. There's going to be one. And he gives them this understanding of, of who this is in one verse. 
Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a son. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. How can a virgin bear a child? How can the seed of the woman crush the head of the serpent? <coughs> It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit because you see we fast forward now 700 years and we see the angel come to Mary and this is what he says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive, soon in your womb, conceive in your womb and bear a son and his name shall be Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And Mary's response is, Ha! I'm a virgin. And here's what we need to hear in conjunction with Genesis 3 and with Isaiah 7. The angel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Here we see God's love for us. That He provided the Lamb, the Savior, the Messiah. So that we gain access back to the you see, the Father only sees us sinless through His Son. We have to come to the foot of the cross. You remember when I talked about hope, we had to come to the foot of the cross to have the hope that Christ gives. We have to come to the foot of the cross to have the peace that Christ gives. We have to come through the foot of the cross to have the joy and abide in Him. And it's no different with His love. The Father loved us so that we would gain access to Him through His Son, the perfect sacrifice. It's His plan. It's His redemptive story. And we see that the angel announces the birth of the Son of God, and we fast forward to 33 years and we come to this text that the Apostle John now gives us. Jesus is in the upper room. And you remember last week I told you he is preparing the disciples for his departure. They don't understand yet, but they will. They will understand even more clearly when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. But he is preparing them. And in this ninth verse, he says, just as... The Father has loved me. I love you. So abide in my love. This verse shows us the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. In fact, in this verse we see the very triune God. You say, well how? We see it in the relationship between my Father has loved me, and I love the Father, and my love is going to be in you. And I will tell you, the only way that you're going to love the Son and the Father is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything less is going to be a worldly love. God gives us the power to abide in Him, to love Him, to stay connected to Him by the power of the Holy Spirit. We see the Godhead in this, that God lavished His love on us in such a way that He would give us His Spirit to call us back to Him. It is the love of God who calls us, and there is no greater love. In this text, as Jesus is teaching them, He is teaching them to abide in His love. He's teaching them to stay grafted to Him, to stay connected to Him, because there is nowhere else that you will find love that sustains, love that lasts. 
this love that Christ gives us through the power of His Holy Spirit is one that will not only sustain us in this life, but it gives us even a glimpse of the love of God that He would send His Son back to claim those that are His. In fact, He loved us so that Paul tells us He sent His Son when I was still sinful. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrate, demonstrated His love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to think about that. While we were yet sinners. In other words, I was disobedient. I am a sinner. And because I am a sinner, even though I am disobedient, God chose to send His Son that I might be reconciled back to Him. How much greater love is there than that? That the Father, even in my disobedience, even in my sin, He would send His Son, His only Son, to die for me. That's love. <coughs> he sees me forgiven through His Son. Because His Son loved me enough to give. Then we come to this next verse. It's a verse that, if you grew up in church, I know you memorized this verse. Uh, Alice Lane would put verses on the board, and we would come into Sunday school, and every week we would have to memorize a verse. John 3.16, the 23rd Psalm, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Uh, we had to... Uh, Romans 3.23 and 24. I mean, every Sunday there was a different verse on the script, on the board, blackboard that we had to learn. And this is one that if you grew up in church, I would dare say that you learned to memorize. And as I quoted it earlier, it just rolls off because it is, I learned it in the King James Version. And that's the way my brain knows it. John 3.16 is such that Martin Luther called it the mini-gospel. He called it the heart of the gospel. You could take John 3.16, he says, and this is the heart of the gospel in a verse. So we, we need to know it. Martin Luther even went as far to give his understanding of this verse. And I want to give you exactly how he viewed this verse. These will be on the screen as I read. Here's what he said. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act. His only son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest invitation believes the greatest simplicity in him the greatest person shall not perish the greatest deliverance but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty eternal life the greatest possession and I'll use that word one more time how great is that That God so loved the world that He would give His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is love. A love of the Father and a love of the Son. That He was obedient even to the point of death. God the Father and God the Son gave. I heard this story about a math teacher. He was trying to help his class understand about fractions, and so he called on Johnny, and he said, Johnny, I'm going to give you a word problem, and I want you to give me the fraction back, okay? Here's the word problem. Your mom's baking a pumpkin pie, and your family consists of you and seven siblings and your mom and dad. 
That's a total of 10 people. What portion of the pie is yours? And Johnny said, one night. Johnny, you didn't get, you, you must have misunderstood what I said. There's 10 of you. There's you, seven siblings, that's eight. Your mom and dad, that's 10. What portion of the pie is yours? Oh. And he said, one night. Teacher looked at him and said, John, don't you know math? He said, sure, I know math. I also know my mom. And my mom's going to cut that pie into nine pieces so that we can have more, and she'll go with that. That's the love of a mom. How greater is the love of our Father in heaven who would give his son, not withholding him, but willing to sacrifice his only son. You see, the object of God's love is the world, and it doesn't mean that his object of his love is the world and the cosmos, the, the world itself. We know that because in this verse of John 3.16, he says, whosoever believes. And so when it says that God loves so loves the world. He's talking about mankind. He's talking about us. So we are the object of his love. John went on in his first letter, Suku is teaching that in our Wednesday night study that begins back in January. And in that first letter, John says this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And so it is not these worldly things, the world that God is talking about that he so loves. He so loves us, a sinner. We are the object of His love, this amazing love. Even as a sinner, He loves me. Think about it. Think about yourself. How do you operate when someone goes against you or you have a, a dispute? How does your love play out? Do you offer love to someone that's disobedient to you? Or is it like, uh -uh, I'm out of here. Think about a relationship between a man and a woman. They begin to date and they begin to grow fond of one another and then they begin to maybe fall in love with one another and that love is nourished and you know it's love when things start to begin to happen and once someone says something and that relationship is bound and held together, if it's, now I, I'm out of here, you know that it was never love to start with. God loved us even when we were disobedient. That's love. Sometimes I think that we forget that line in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me as I forgive others. <coughs> How's that working for us? It's not that way with God. Thank goodness it's not that way with God. Can you imagine if our disobedience, our sin was such that God says, I'm out of here. You're on your own. We'd be in trouble. God loves us. Even when we don't love Him. God expressed His love towards us even before we knew Him. <clears throat> Paul is absolutely right when he says that He loved us even as a sinner. There is no greater love 
Do we really understand the love of Christ that Isaiah <coughs> speaks about? This love that will come in the form of a child called Emmanuel, God with us. This child that the angel tells Mary that you will name Jesus. He will be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Do we really understand the love of God through Jesus Christ? Well, I can tell you that we certainly need to. We need to understand it. Because with, with John 3.16, John doesn't stop there. You see, you have to read the next two verses. So in verse 17, John tells us, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's the good news. That's glory. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And then verse 18. He who believes... He who believes in Him, Jesus Christ, is not judged. Amen. He who does not believe has already been judged. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of the Father. God has given us His love in Jesus Christ. The redemptive plan is in place. It is for us to believe and know through the power of the Holy Spirit that calls us to Him that this is the Christ. This is the chosen one of God. Jesus leaves that upper room and He <coughs> prays. And I want you to hear in John 17 the high priestly prayer what Jesus prays. In verse 22, he says, The glory which you, God, you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as you and I are one. And then listen to what he says, and says in verse 23, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me. And here's the key. That you sent me. Even as you have loved me. He loves us. He sent His Son to die for us. He poured out His love on the cross for us. And He loves us enough that He's going to come back for us. You see, the same John that wrote about the love of a father who would send his son, the same John that writes and gives us understanding of what is and is not love in the world. The same John received the revelation that God loved us enough not only to send His Son this redemptive plan of salvation, but that one day, either in my death or His second coming, that I get to be with Him. That's the last phrase there in that John 3, 16, eternal life, that I get to gain eternal life in His name because I believe. The Christ child, Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior that was born in Bethlehem. This is the Savior of the world. This is the one that we believe came so that we might have life in Him. <coughs> If you are not in love with God the Son and God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to do so. Because it is there, not only will you find eternal life in the life to come, but 
but as you live out your life in this world, that is where hope, peace, joy, and love will be displayed so that others can see the living Christ. My prayer for all of us this season is that once again we will fall in love with him who saved us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that draws men and women, women to you. We thank you, Father, that you know us, that even in our disobedience and our sin, that you died for us. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for his life, death, and resurrection. And we thank you that as we come again to celebrate the birth of your Son for the first time, we understand just a glimpse, just a taste of the love that you have for us. Vast as the oceans, poured out and lavished on us sinners, Yet you loved us that much to send your only Son, Jesus, our Savior. Father, may we fall in love with you again in such a way that others in this lost world would see you through our life, through our walk, through our, our, our talk, through our communications, through the love that we have with those that are different than us, those that maybe have disrespected us, whatever, Father, may you help us to love one another. You went on to say in, in that 15th chapter, no greater love would one would have that he would give his life for another. Call us to love you and each other. May that be so, Father. May that be so. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.